Western philosophy as we know it today originated at a more or less identifiable time and place, namely in a region of Asia Minor known as Ionia in the early 6th century BC. We may even further pinpoint the origins of Western philosophical thought to a specific Ionian city, Miletus, which was home to the earliest thinkers that would eventually be called philosophers, that is, lovers of wisdom. One thing that should be clarified right away is that the earliest of philosophers have not left us manuscripts or books that we might simply translate, read, and comprehend. Their writings have not survived throughout history except in fragments, and so their ideas must be pieced together from these fragments and from, from what later writers have said about them. In spite of these limitations, we are able to come to a few broad but still safe conclusions about who these philosophers were and what they believed. Perhaps the most basic of these conclusions is what, for them, was the most important philosophical question, namely, what is everything? It was not an overly complicated question, and they actually meant it quite literally. In other words, what is the fundamental element out of which everything is made? These early Greek-speaking thinkers actually had a word for this fundamental element for which they were looking. They called it the Arche. The earliest philosopher, whose beliefs can be even somewhat reconstructed, is a man named Thales. In response to the question of the Arche, Thales had a simple answer. Everything is ultimately water. Everything, in other words, whether it's a rock, a cloud, a tree, or a human being, is composed of water in one form or another. Of course, it's easy to laugh at Thales' primitive ideas and notice only how wrong he was. As we all know, water cannot be the arche because water itself is composed of still more elementary components, hydrogen and oxygen. And yet, it's not difficult to understand how Thales arrived at this conclusion. After all, he lived in a coastal city, Miletus, and he may have easily surmised that there is a lot more water on the earth than any other one thing. Thales no doubt also observed that water itself can take on various forms right before our eyes, changing in a matter of seconds from a solid to a liquid to a gas. Finally, Thales may have observed that water is a crucial component of all living things, which are mostly composed of water and which require water for survival. By dismissing Thales' ideas because they were simply wrong, however, most people end up missing the most important lesson to be gained. The problem with Thales' philosophy is not so much that that philosophy is incorrect, but that it is philosophically incoherent. Let me explain. In saying that everything is ultimately composed of water, Thales renders himself unable to answer two critical questions that he must answer in order for his theory to have any meaning whatsoever. The first question is this, what is water? This may first seem like an easy question to answer. One might simply point to a glass of water, a swimming pool, or the ocean. But if we truly understand what Thales is saying, this simple answer is really no answer at all. Why? Because if Thales is correct in saying that everything is water, then it follows that a piece of concrete or an apple is water as well. To be sure, concrete and apple would satisfy the definition of water just as much as the ocean. But on that score, then we might as well say that the entire universe is constituted of concrete or apple. Doing so on Thales' theory would ultimately be no less correct. 
The second question is just as impossible for Thales to answer adequately. Namely, what causes water to change forms? In other words, how does one explain why water is found in the form of an ocean in one case, a mountain in another case, and a rhinoceros in yet another case? What is the reason behind this wide diversity and multiplicity of forms? If Thales is correct in saying that all reality is water and only water, this question is ultimately unanswerable because no room is left for any external cause of what water might do. Of course, someone in Thales' position might refuse to answer the question by insisting that there simply is no explanation of water's various behaviors. But this would be somewhat unsatisfying as a philosophical answer to a perfectly legitimate question. Finally, if Thales were to explain the diversity and change found in water by appealing to some smaller element from which water is composed, then water would no longer be the arche, and one would have all the same problems with regard to that element, whatever it was. In the final analysis, Thales is confronted by irresolvable problems, not because he's wrong in identifying the arche as water, but because of his misguided attempt to reduce all reality down to one material principle. As we will see, this is a problem not just for Thales, but for many philosophers that come after him as well. This leads us to a philosopher by the name of Anaximander, also from the city of Miletus, who was probably a younger associate, even a student of Thales. Although Anaximander was principally interested in the same thing as Thales, finding the Arche, he arrived at a very different conclusion. It's possible that Anaximander saw clearly the problem with saying that everything is water and the impossibility of clearly answering the highlighted question above, what is water? As we saw, if everything is water, water can't really be defined. To define something is to set limits on it, to say what it is and what it isn't. But on Thales' theory, the only way to identify water properly would be to say, well, it's just everything, which is really no definition at all. Perhaps realizing this, Anaximander probably also realized that this problem occurs no matter what one identifies as the Arche. If the Arche is Earth, same problem. If the Arche is fire, same problem. If the Arche is air, as a later philosopher Anaximenes argued, same problem. This is most likely what led Anaximander to say that the Arche is indeterminate and hence indefinable, and he accordingly referred to it as the indeterminate principle. Everything, therefore, is made out of the indeterminate principle, according to Anaximander. In one way, this is an improvement, and in another way, it is not. Anaximander avoids the problem of not being able to define the arche as water, air, or anything else by referring to it as precisely that which cannot be defined. The arche, he says, is not a this or a that. It cannot be any particular kind of thing, but is only that out of which all other kinds of things are composed. In another sense, though, Anaximander seems to have just run away from the question at hand. If he's going to argue that there is an arche, some element out of which all things are composed, does that not place an obligation upon him to describe what the arche is? If he cannot do this, why should we believe that there's an arche at all? Moreover, Anaximander is completely ill-equipped to resolve the second problem that faced his friend Thales. Granted that there is some one element out of which all reality is composed, what accounts for the fact that this element is found in different forms? What accounts, in other words, for the change and multiplicity that we see before us in the natural world?
If all that there is at bottom is the indeterminate principle, why does that indeterminate principle take the forms of water, dirt, plants, and animals? Anaximander, because he also reduces everything to one principle, cannot answer this question any better than Thales. It may well have been the failure of these early philosophers to identify the Arche in any coherent way that caused Heraclitus, who lived about a century after Thales, to deny the existence of an Arche altogether. Heraclitus was also from Asia Minor and lived in the city of Ephesus. Rather than identify the world as capable of being boiled down to a single element, such as water or air or even some undefinable thing, Heraclitus denied that there exists any identifiable basis to reality at all. Instead of seeing the world as an arche changing from one kind of thing to another, Heraclitus accepted as real only change itself. Moreover, change, he believed, is a constant and omnipresent force. So, amazingly, there is no such thing as an oak tree, a human being, or a rock. These things we perceive are just moments or freeze frames in an ever-changing world. A living oak tree, for example, is just the halfway point between an acorn and a pile of ashes left after the oak tree burns down. Nothing, therefore, is ever a this or a that. Everything is something on the way to becoming something else, which is in turn on the way to becoming something else. The best way to sum up Heraclitus' view of reality, then, is to say that everything is in a state of flux. Another way of putting it is that there is no being, nothing that exists as a this or a that, only becoming. Even we ourselves do not really exist as abiding beings who can be said to exist as beings. There is only the configuration of cells and molecules that comprise my body at any given moment, and a different configuration of cells and molecules that comprise my body at some other moment. But what makes Heraclitus' view so radical is that what's true for our bodies is also true for those cells and molecules or whatever still more basic element from which they are composed so that there exists no stable or identifiable basis of reality at all. And for this reason, of course, there can be no RK either, since the very notion of an RK is that there does exist something stable underlying all reality and out of which all reality is composed. Because Heraclitus seems to have denied the reality of being, by asserting that everything is in a state of becoming or flux, he is also believed to have denied what seems to follow from that, namely truth. Though to be sure, this is much more difficult to discern from the fragments of Heraclitus's writings that we have today. But if all reality is an ever-changing state of flux, it does seem to follow that no claims about reality can ever be simply true or false. And yet there seems to be something terribly incoherent about that conclusion. For the claim that all reality is in flux, and nothing we say about it can be true or false, is itself a claim about reality. And so consistency would demand that it too cannot be affirmed any more than any other claim about reality. Heraclitus's thought finds its antithesis in the next philosopher that we will examine, namely Parmenides. Parmenides lived and philosophized close to the time of Heraclitus, though his precise dates are uncertain. He was from Elia, a Greek colony in southern Italy, and his philosophy was so influential that he is considered the founder of what is now called the Eleatic School of Thought. The reason Parmenides' philosophy is considered the opposite of Heraclitus's is that 
Whereas Heraclitus believed that the world can only be understood as a constant sea of change, Parmenides insisted that change is actually not real at all. Change, in other words, is an illusion. We might think of it this way. Recall that Thales and Anaximander, in reducing the world to one element, could not ultimately account for the fact that that element takes on so many forms by undergoing change. So, in some sense then, Parmenides attempts to deal with that problem, not by explaining how change occurs, but by denying that it occurs. And instead of identifying the arche as water, air, earth, fire, or some combination of these, he simply calls it being. Being, therefore, is the only thing that is real. We might think that we are perceiving being as different forms of beings, such as trees, animals, rocks, and human beings. But this differentiation or diversity of being into different kinds of beings is, for Parmenides, just as illusory as change. What would lead Parmenides to affirm such a strange teaching? From what we can make out, he seems to have drawn this as a conclusion from the apparently self-evident truth that nothing can come from nothing. But since all change involves something coming from nothing, then change is impossible. An acorn that grows into an oak tree might be an example of change. But where, Parmenides would ask, did the oak tree come from? If we just respond that it came from the acorn, he would further ask how an oak tree can come from something that is not an oak tree. But if the oak tree was already somehow in the acorn, then there really was no change at all. Nor would there be any changes occurring in what we think we're noticing all the time. One of Parmenides' disciples, Zeno, made the argument another way in the form of his famous paradox, which examines one kind of change in particular, namely the motion of something from one location to another. As the paradox goes, for an insect to move from point A to point B, it must first travel halfway between these two points. But to travel from point A to the halfway point, it must first travel halfway between those points. But to get there, it must first travel halfway again, and again, and again. On the assumption that numbers may be infinitely divided, and an infinite number of halfway points must be traversed, it seems to follow that the insect will never get from point A to point B. But once we accept that, it also follows that the insect will never get from point A to the halfway point, which we could just as easily call point B. In fact, the insect will never be able to move at all, since the same problem would apply to any two points, however close together they might be. As Zeno argues in defense of Parmenides, what holds for moving from one place to another also holds for every other kind of change, since change, after all, is really nothing other than a kind of movement from one state of affairs to another state of affairs. Parmenides' argument, of course, flies in the face of our everyday experience, and we seem to observe change occurring all the time. As Aristotle would argue later on, the job of the philosopher is not to question whether change occurs, but to explain how it occurs. In some ways, though, the very attempt to make a philosophical argument and persuade others of its validity already presupposes the existence of change. If a skeptic eventually comes to the conclusion that Parmenides is right, a change will have occurred in the mind of the skeptic, thus proving Parmenides wrong. The only way for the skeptic not to prove Parmenides wrong, therefore, is to go on believing that Parmenides is wrong. As in the case of Heraclitus, something about Parmenides' theory seems to lead us directly into the absurd.
The philosophers we've looked at so far are often called pre-Socratic philosophers, which calls attention to the towering figure of Socrates, who was put to death in Athens in 399 BC. There are a great many pre-Socratic philosophers in addition to the ones we've seen, including Pythagoras, Melissus, Empedocles, and Anaxagoras. But all of them are, in some way or other, struggling with the same fundamental problem. How to provide an explanation of the world. Some explanation of what the world fundamentally is. While still accounting for the diversity of things that exist and the change that appears to occur among them. This problem has fittingly been described as the problem of the one and the many. The problem of the one and the many is equally central to the last thinker that we'll examine in this lecture, namely Democritus, who is from the city of Abdera in northern Greece and was born sometime in the mid-5th century BC. Democritus is known as an atomist because of his conviction that everything in the world, everything that exists, may be understood as a conglomeration of tiny invisible atoms. This means that nothing really has the nature of a cat, a dog, a man, or a tree. But what we call cats, dogs, human beings, and trees are simply accidental conglomerations of atoms that appear to us in dog-like, cat-like, or human-like ways. This means that the only way to truly understand something is to break it down into its most elementary parts and to see how those parts are arranged. Ironically then, it also follows from this that the atoms themselves, the most basic or elementary parts, cannot really be understood since they themselves are not reducible or explainable in terms of still simpler parts. In many ways, Adams are, for Democritus, his answer to the question of the Arche, and he is well known for suggesting that there exists nothing other than atoms and void, that is to say, these tiny elemental particles and the empty space between them. As to why the atoms are arranged in the way that they are, a common atomist myth is that there was a time in the past when all atoms were uniform, none touching any other, until, as suggested by a later atomist, Lucretius, one of them inexplicably swerved and set off a chain reaction, resulting in the multiform world that we observe today. Lucretius is careful not to provide an explanation or cause for this swerve, because he's well aware that that would also need an explanation, which would require a still further explanation, and so on, and so on. Eventually, he knows that he's going to have to admit that the world just exists inexplicably anyway, so he might as well just identify the source of that inexplicability with the swerve itself, rather than get caught up in an infinite regress of explanations. It's worth noting that the ancient atomism of Democritus, although very primitive, is something that many people influenced by modern science still believe a version of today. It is very much an atomist approach to think that the only way to truly understand something is to break it down into its component parts and to discover how the whole is explained by the interaction of those parts. If, for example, someone thinks that everything about a person can be understood by means of an intimate familiarity with how their brain works and the complex interaction of neurons in the brain, they probably subscribe to some form of Democritian atomism. The atomism of Democritus and his school of thought is fraught with many philosophical problems. In fact, the 19th century atheist philosopher, Friedrich Nietzsche, actually called atomism, quote, one of the best refuted theories there are. In addition to providing no explanation as to how the atoms came to be arranged in the way that they're arranged, the atomist also seems very hard pressed to account for things that seem to defy a materialistic explanation altogether, 
such as ideas, concepts, and beliefs in our minds. If the atomist is right, a belief in my mind can really be nothing other than a particular arrangement of material parts, whether we call them atoms, neurons, or something else. And yet it makes no sense to say that one person's arrangement of neurons is true and another person's is false. If atomism is right, therefore, truth and falsity don't even really apply to the ideas of our minds. But this would, of course, include a person's belief in the truth of atomism. How can we believe a theory is true if that theory forces us to conclude that, in the end, there can really be no true beliefs at all? What are we to conclude from all of this? In some sense, the story of these early philosophers is one of failure, and they seem to have raised many more questions than they answered. But even in raising the fundamental questions they did, they nevertheless rendered a great service to the philosophical giants that would come shortly thereafter, Socrates, Plato, and above all, Aristotle and Thomas Aquinas. <laughs>